morning and welcome to our service at St. Giles. Uh, Eddie Stopforth is going to be uh, taking the service. She's running a little bit late, so uh, I will kick off uh, in the meanwhile. Uh, welcome to all of, the, all of those of you that are here and welcome to those that are uh, watching on the feed. Uh, our call to worship is a responsive call to worship. Uh, if you can please respond in the bold. God alone is our refuge and hope. Our shelter and protection. From our very first breath to our last. God's, God's love, love and compassion, compassion never fails. fails. So come, lift your voices in praise to God. Bear witness to God's acts of mercy and love. Proclaim God's glory to all who will listen. Let's worship God together. Our first hymn uh, on the TV is Be Thou My Vision. come before you with expectant hearts we just ask that you will speak to us this morning you will touch us in a special way 
that when we leave this place we may leave it knowing that you are with us, you are strengthening us and you are lifting us up. All this we ask in your name, Lord. Amen. Welcome, Eddie. It's great to have you with us. Do you want me to carry on with the Bible readings and then? Yes, just carry on. Certainly. <laughs> Catch your breath. Uh, so our scripture readings this morning, we've got three of them. Uh, the first is from Job 38 verses 1 to 7. The Lord answers Job. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? And then from Acts chapter 9 verses 1 to 9, the conversion of Saul. Meanwhile Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And then from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. Peter's declaration about Jesus. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on, er bound on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Thanks be to God. Over to you. <laughs> and welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Do I need to adjust this? There we go. I'm getting really good at microphones. Would you pray with me, please? God, your word is a light to our feet. 
and a lamp to our path. And we walk securely when we walk in your way. I pray that you will take these thoughts of my mind, these feelings of my heart and these words of my mouth, and that you will use them so that this morning we will hear you speaking. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, when our eldest son finished university, he spread his wings and he flew off to see what it would be like to live in London, where he joined a group of young Christians in an interdenominational church. At about this time, the civil strife that had been raging in Bosnia, which is a little country that broke away from Yugoslavia when the Soviet Union disintegrated. Well, the civil war in Bosnia came to an end. And Justin, that's our kid, uh, joined a team of young people who went into Bosnia to minister to the youth in this post-war environment. In his emails to us over the three weeks he was there, he talked a lot about the physical damage that the war had done, about bullet holes in walls and roads that had been ripped up and broken down houses. But it was the people who touched him the most. I can't believe the guts that some of these people have, he wrote. I've always taken my ability to go to church for granted. But after watching a young girl of about 16 hide in the dormitories at the church with us because she couldn't leave until her Muslim uncle, who was doing some building work at the church, had left for fear of being seen and having her family find out that she was a Christian, I now consider this a privilege. Most of the people I met had horror stories about themselves or family members and almost all of them had had to flee their home country in order to escape the war. But they all wanted to put it behind them and work with others to prevent it from happening again. I have no idea, he wrote, what it takes to forgive things like that. Back in the safety of London later, he wrote, it was a truly amazing experience. I have grown so much and in so many ways. God really spoke to me while I was there and he asked some really tough questions to which I now have to go and find some answers. For Justin, this was an important time. <clears throat> he understood that the tough questions God had asked were a challenge to him. It was a scary time for him and for us as his parents. But the Bible teaches us that a positive response by us to God's sometimes tough questions leads us into a deeper and closer relationship with him. I have picked three biblical examples of this. Positive responses to tough questions for us to have a look at today. And the first is Job. Shame. Poor Job. <laughs> there he was, you see, with everything he could possibly have wanted. A wonderful family, masses of livestock, lots of servants to look after everything that he had. He was highly respected in the region and in the words of the scriptures was blameless and upright before God. And then disaster struck. In a series of freak events, Job lost all his children, all his livestock, and all his servants, uh, except the three that came back to tell him what had happened. Then he broke out in boils all over his body, and probably because any skin condition back then was considered to be leprosy, he was cast out of society. All he had left was his wife, and she wasn't much help, I can tell you. <laughs> Mind you, that's a mean thing to say. Shame, they were her kids too. So she was probably overwhelmed by her own grief. And in typical Old Testament tradition, the story is about him rather than about her. According to the orthodox theology of the time, prosperity was God's reward for good living, 
calamity was God's judgment on sin. So if Job was suffering, he must have been a wicked man. At least that's what his friends thought, and they went to great lengths to try to persuade him. But Job knew in his heart this wasn't true. He knew he had been faithful to God, knew he had not deserved punishment, certainly not of this nature. Yet he was faced with the reality of his situation and he just couldn't figure it out. Couldn't understand why God was being so unfair. At this point, God himself intervened in the passage that we read this morning. He challenged Job with a whole series of questions. Like, where was Job when God made the world? the light and darkness, the wind and the rain, the constellations in their courses. What did Job know about the creatures of the world? Did he make them? Could he feed them? Could he tame them as God could do? As God revealed himself to Job through his questions, Job came to understand that he had been trying to measure God against his own standards that his mental image of God had been much too small. The God who confronted him was God on a different scale altogether. And in the face of his glory, all Job's problems took on a very different perspective. Job was completely overwhelmed. And his reaction, like that of doubting Thomas years later, was to bow down in worship. Now it's true that God restored Job, that he was blessed with a new family, with more worldly goods and so on. But none of this could have surpassed the incredible experience of meeting with God face to face and the difference that this would have made to the relationship that existed between them. Another person challenged by a tough question was the Apostle Paul. Saul of Tarsus was raised strictly according to the law of Israel. He trained under Gamaliel, one of the most respected teachers of his day, and said of himself in Acts 26 verse 5 that he lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of his religion. If we're going to understand Paul and what happened to him, we first need to understand the Pharisees with whom he identified himself so strongly. It seems likely that the roots of the Pharisees lie in the exiles who returned from Babylon about 400 years before all this happened. When Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar and the temple was destroyed, the Jews were convinced that this tragedy had befallen them because God was displeased with them, that they were being punished for failing to obey God's law. So they saw the return from exile as a God-given opportunity to put things right, and they determined that in future they would obey the law. I mean, they were really going to obey the law, to the nth degree, so to speak, in what was, I think, a sincere attempt to please God. The scholars began to study the law, to break it down into bite-sized pieces, to clarify it, to expound it, to analyze it, you name it, they did it. For generations, this process continued until in Jesus' day, we meet a group of people for whom the law had become more important than anything else. So concentrated were they on the law that they saw nothing else. They had tunnel vision, like wearing spiritual blinkers. Do you know what blinkers are? I do. But that's probably only because I'm old enough to remember when we were still allowed to have horse-drawn vehicles on the road. The problem was that the hustle and bustle of people and cars frightened the horses. So they put leather flaps on the side of their eyes like this so that the horses could only see what was directly in front of them and that way they stayed calm and under control. 
The Pharisees could only see the law. They could only see what was directly in front of them. Saul, full of youthful dedication to the law, set out to eradicate this dreadfully unlawful sect of Christians. And in doing this, he hoped to please God. Imagine his confusion when Jesus confronted him face to face and asked the question, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Instead of pleasing God, as he thought he was doing, Saul was faced with the reality that he had in fact been hurting God. Saul's thinking had to do a 180 degree turnaround and his conversion to Christianity took him into a relationship with God that has inspired the church for countless generations. And the third challenging question I want to look at was directed by Jesus to the disciples in general, but answered by Peter in particular. The conversation started with Jesus asking who other people thought that he, Jesus, was. There were various answers to that, all of them a little bit spooky. Some sort of reincarnation or personification of somebody who was already dead. Clearly these answers were not to be taken seriously. Then came the big question, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. With all the wisdom of hindsight, this answer might appear obvious to us. But was it that obvious to them? Just think about it for a bit. What if there was a person you had known for some time, a few years maybe, and in that time you'd been together a lot, walking, talking, eating, going fishing, feeling tired, getting wet in the rain, all the stuff that makes up human life. Then if that person asked you, who do you say that I am? You might say something like, oh, I know all about you. You're Joe Soap. You've been a member at St. Giles for years. You're married to Margaret. You've got three grandchildren. You like ice cream. And just by the way, you overcook your steak when you bry. <laughs> you see, in human relationships with human people, we make human associations. The disciples knew Jesus as a human person, certainly a very special person, but nevertheless human. So recognizing his deity, seeing him as the Christ, the son of the living God, was a major change in understanding for them. And that change in understanding brought with it a change in their relationship with Jesus. Instead of being a rather motley bunch of men, they would become the church, the body of Christ on earth, to whom God would entrust the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Each of these men, Job, Paul and Peter, experienced what our Justin felt back then, a challenge to re-examine the relationship, a challenge to grow, a challenge to change. I imagine that each one of us has faced a situation like this at one time or a moment at, at, or other. A moment when we've had to choose this way or that way. When we've had to say yes or no. One such moment came in my own life about 25 years ago. At a time when I used to spend three quarters of an hour morning and evening on the freeway between Pretoria, where I lived, and Bromfontein, where I worked. I used to spend the evening drive time catching up on the day's news on the radio, and the morning drive time in quiet time with the Lord. One morning, a clear thought formed itself in my mind, as clearly as if the words had been spoken out loud. 
Will you come with me? Unsure of how to react, I said, where to? There was no answer. A day or two later, the words came again. Will you come with me? This time my answer was different and I said yes. For me, that was a life-changing moment. It was a decision that, amongst a whole lot of other things, took me out of the pew in the back of the church and into the general assembly, took me out of the Sunday school and into the pulpit. My positive response to God's challenge, just like Job, Paul and Peter, brought changes and new responsibilities that increased my sense of reliance on God and deepened and strengthened my relationship with him. We stand today in the first month of a new year, a year which appears to promise the slowing down of the dreadful pandemic that we have been experiencing. And I believe that the church is facing a challenge as God calls us out of the relative safety of the bubble of the COVID-19 restrictions and back into society as a whole. We actually don't know what the post-COVID society is going to be like, do we? So I call the sermon, Where To? From Here. Because I think that's the sort of question that St. Giles, like every other congregation, is going to be asking itself. It's an important question. And it goes along with questions like, should we work to restore everything to what it was like before the pandemic started? Can we pick up the pieces and put the picture that was St. Giles and its ministry back together again? Some might think that this is the way to go, a form of ministry that is tried and true, the safety of doing things the way we have always done them. But will this work if society has changed? And how will we know? How will we get people to leave the comfort of their homes and come back to worship? What should we do with the new, mostly technical skills that we have learned, with the new ways of being church that we have been practicing? What lies ahead of us? In short, where do we go from here? But while these are the questions that I think that we will be asking ourselves, I don't believe God is asking any of those questions. I believe that God is asking his church, asking St. Giles what he asked me. Will you come with me? That is the most important decision that has to be made. It's also the first decision that has to be made. As we plan for the future, are we going to start the process with thoughts of what we want and often stronger thoughts of what we don't want? Or are we going to allow God to be in control? Will we trust him to lead us into this rather scary post-COVID world and simultaneously into a deeper, richer relationship with him? It's not really that difficult a choice to make, you know. We can trust God. He is completely trustworthy. And if we involve him in all our decision making, we can be confident of the outcome. Whatever that outcome looks like, if we arrive at that place with God, we will have arrived at the right place. So when you hear the question, where do we go from here? Be sure to answer, we go with God. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, that you are always there. That if we reach out, you allow us to touch you. 
Thank you that you involve us yourself in our affairs and that you give us the privilege to work alongside you in yours. Father, as this congregation and the other congregations of your church all over the world come into the decision-making process of where to from here, I pray that we will all turn to you first and that we will follow in your footsteps. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are going to stand. We don't stand, right? No. no. We're not allowed to stand. And we're not allowed to sing with our masks off. So the best you can with your mask on, we're going to sing, Oh God, our help in ages past. Giving to God is a form of ministry. Um, we give to God out of what he gives to us. Uh, and so we come to that time in our service of worship when we consider our giving to God. Um, I understand that there is a... Is there a... Okay, so there is a collection bowl over here and one at the back. Uh, if you have brought a, an offering with you this morning that you want to leave, will you please put it in one of the bowls? And I don't know about you, but my own congregation at Midchurch, uh, who, by the way, sends greetings, I should have said that at the beginning, that Midrand Presbyterian Church says good morning to St. Giles. So Midrand Presbyterian Church, we have persuaded a lot of our members to use direct uh, bank transfers. Um, but but for, for some people, that is just not comfortable. For some people, the gift needs to be a physical thing. And so if you have brought a physical gift this morning, would you please put it in the offering plates on your way out? 
So can we ask God to bless these offerings? Father, we bring to you out of what you have given to us just a token of our thanksgiving and a contribution from us towards the work of your kingdom here on earth. Father, I pray that you will bless the givers. You will bless the givers present in the room and you will bless the givers who have put their money into the bank. That you will bless this money, these gifts of money, and that you will use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. Father, we don't only bring gifts of money, we bring the ultimate gift, which is ourselves. We bring ourselves to you and ask that you will use us, that you will strengthen us and guide us and teach us and turn us into something that is useful in your kingdom and that you will use us to spread the love of Jesus Christ throughout this world. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do I do the pastoral care or is it personalized? No, we, we, we discussed the names earlier and during the pastoral prayer we don't mention any names, so it's just a general. Okay. Okay, because I actually prepared a prayer for us. So, shall we come before God in prayer? God our Father, in love you created us. In love you welcome us as your children. In love you lead us faithfully. And with your mercy you hear our prayers. Jesus our Redeemer, you have come to save the world and to save us. You call us to follow you. You teach us truth. In our time of trouble, you offer us peace. Holy Spirit, living one, in the beginning you breathed life in chaos and darkness. You brought hope one starry night by bringing good news that a Saviour had been born. And early on Easter morning, you defeated death forever. Holy God, loving Father, Son and Spirit, we come before you, yet we know we come with doubts and fears, we know we come with ignorance. We know that we have failed you, your creation and your people in many ways. Trusting in your love, we turn again to you. As we open our hearts to your mercy and forgiveness, grant us your peace. Lord Jesus, please forgive us. Heal us deep within, so that we love and trust you more deeply, day by day. And Father, as we stand for this moment clothed in the righteousness of your Son, Jesus, we would pray for the world around us. Father, the news is overwhelmingly full of difficulties, of floods and snowfalls and earthquakes and things that disrupt the lives and sometimes take the lives of people all over the world. We are powerless in the face of these natural calamities. And sometimes the damage that they do is so overwhelming that we are powerless to deal with the damage. But we know that nothing is too difficult for you and that you will bring good out of these things that are so bad. Father, we pray for our country. We pray for the political situation. We pray for the financial situation. And we pray, Lord, about the pandemic. We pray, Lord, that you will bring us safely through however much longer it still has to run. We thank you, Lord, that in fact we have had relatively little hardship in South Africa compared to what has happened elsewhere. And we thank you for the wisdom of the leaders who led us through that. Lord, we pray for your family here at St. Charles, for each member who is ill, for the families who are looking after those who are ill, 
For those of us who, Lord, are just old and tired, we pray, Lord, for the ministry that happens here, and we pray for Melanie that you will bless her and strengthen her and give her great wisdom. Pray, Lord, for your church all over the world. Ask that you will lead us into the place that you would have us be. In Jesus' name. Amen. We have come to the end of our service this morning. I pray that God has spoken. I pray that we will have heard him. I pray that the gathering of two or more in his name will be a blessing to us and be a gift, a sacrifice to him. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen. everybody.